Well, hi everybody and welcome back to our weekly Bible study here at King's Revival Church International. I'm Gareth and I'm so super stoked to be with all of you today. Um, for if you are for the very first time, well, you are our very, very special guest. So welcome. Um, yeah, today we'd love to hear who you are, where, where you're from. And so make sure that you drop a comment uh, below or, or like and, and share this message. And uh, we just love to, to hear where you are from. And I know that you are going to be blessed by the end of this broadcast. And so um, I want to encourage you also, when, whenever we have our Bible study, make sure that you bring your Bibles. Make sure that you follow along. Make sure that you read in your own Bible. Make sure that you have a Bible and uh, that you are reading the Bible. So when I share this lesson, it's based on the Bible. It's from the Bible. And uh, we, you know, in, these, in these 30 minutes that we spent together, I, I share usually a, a, a proper lesson with points. And uh, you, so you can take notes and you can reshare this. You can teach us again. If you're in a home cell, um, you're welcome to, to share whatever I teach here. Yeah, take down those notes. Well, I know we're, we're in an age of technology, so you can um, uh, go back, rewind, watch it again multiple times until you get it and, and, um, and make it yours. So today we're going to look at the beauty of God's grace. That is my message today. And, and um, by way of introduction, I, I actually preached this message a, a, a few years ago. And, and I just felt in my spirit that, that I need to share it with you again today. And it's really about the, the doctrine of great grace. And we're going to look at Mephibosheth, the story of Mephibosheth in the Old Testament. And, you know, um, uh, in the New Testament, we see the doctrine of grace. And the doctrine of grace, Paul writes in, in Romans, in Ephesians, in Galatians. He, he talks extensively about the doctrine of grace. And I was pleasantly surprised when I saw this theme, this doctrine of grace in the story of Mephibosheth in the Old Testament. And I'm going to share with you three things about God's grace that we can, that we can learn uh, from Mephibosheth. And so if you have your Bible, please turn with me to the second book of Samuel chapter 9. That'll be the, the, the main portion of our teaching today. And when you look at the Old Testament, David is a type of Christ. He, he is, a, he is a, the shadow of Jesus Christ. And, and so in uh, 2 Samuel 9 verse 3, we see that David shows kindness towards Mephibosheth. And, and that is really a picture of God who's showing kindness to sinners. You know, once I was a, a sinner, I wasn't serving God. And, and it was the grace of God. It was the love of God that uh, he, he revealed himself to me while I was still a sinner. It was through his grace that he, he, he died for me at the cross. And uh, we're going to see this this grace illustrated in the story of Mephibosheth. And so David, is, his, his life is intertwined with, with Saul, King Saul, and Jonathan, and, and, and Mephibosheth. And um, so if you have your Bibles, I want to, before we go to 2 Samuel, let's go to 1 Samuel, and um, chapter 18, verse 1 to 4. And, and just to put it in context, in, in chapter 17, we see that David killed Goliath. He, he killed him and he was the champion. The Bible says that he was only a teen, teenager. Well, um, scholars reckon he was around 15 to 16 years old and he defeated the champion of the Philistines, Goliath. And so, yeah, we see that Jonathan in, in 1 Samuel 18 verse 1 to 4, Jonathan makes a covenant with David. Uh, Jonathan, being the, the crown prince of Israel, he was the son of King Saul. And let's see what happens here. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Verse 2, And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David. Because he loved him as his own soul. 
And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor, even his sword and his bow and his belt. So yeah, we see that Jonathan made a covenant with David. And I want to submit to you today that when we become born again, our souls become knit with Jesus. See there in verse 1, as soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And so Jesus loves us. And Jesus gave, uh, the Father gave his one and only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Even while we were sinners, God gave his Son, Jesus Christ, to be, to be crucified um, for us, for the forgiveness of our sins, and so that we could enter into relationship with him and everlasting life. And so we see, yeah, that the soul of Jonathan was knit to David. And um, you know, when, when we receive Jesus, we become a part of the heavenly kingdom, that heavenly family, the family of Christ. Uh, see in verse 2, And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. It wasn't that David couldn't go back to his home anymore, but it's just that um, Saul wanted him in the, in the palace. He wanted him there. So he changed residence and that was his, his, his house of you know where he lived and he could obviously go back to his to his father's house jesse's house to visit and stuff but he became part of the family and so when we receive jesus we become a part of the family hallelujah and so why the question i want to ask is why did jonathan make a covenant with david well the answer is there because he loved him and you know what jesus makes a covenant with us because he loves us praise god if you look in luke chapter 22 verse 19 and 20 it says jesus is speaking he says and he took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to them saying this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me and likewise, the cup after they'd eaten, saying, this cup uh, that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And so we see that Jesus makes a covenant. He's saying, this is the blood, my blood, and it's, it's poured out as a covenant um, with you. And when we receive Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior, we become a part of that covenant well what is a covenant at its most basic level a covenant is an oath bound relationship you make an oath with the other party and if you look in ancient times we'll see that there were covenants were made and there were various ways that one could enter into a covenant but the hebrew word for covenant is bereth and that word bereth means to cut and when we study the Bible, we see that they would take an animal and they would cut the animal in half. And they would walk in between the two halves and they would pronounce the blessings or the curses uh, of that covenant that they were making with the other party. And so the two people would enter into an oath bound relationship and this was more powerful than a contract you see because a contract is only based on your character or your word and you could you could you can annul a, a contract you can you your your character is sometimes depending on the person is pretty flimsy you know and so um a, a contract was something different you your life was on the line if you did not withhold your side of the covenant you you in other words you are reliable to death to death if you did not keep your side of the covenant and so yeah we see um that jonathan made a covenant with david um and so like i said earlier on jonathan was the crown prince of israel and he was willing to give it all even his right to the throne um, so Jonathan, the Bible says, stripped himself of his robe and gave his armor, his sword, his bow and his belt. We see there in verse uh, three, uh, verse four. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. Well, why did he do that? Because that was one of the ways that you would enter into a covenant. 
um, with someone else. They did that in ancient times. Sometimes it would be uh, by, through a meal. They would share a covenant meal. And today we, we are reminded of that covenant when we partake of the bread and the juice. Praise God. We, we, we do it in remembrance of of the cross, of where the blood flowed from Jesus at the cross of Calvary. Whenever we take the communion, we are ratifying that covenant. We're remembering the covenant. We're remembering the benefits. We're remembering our Lord and, and our Savior. And, and so what happened in this case is that the Bible says that Jonathan took off his robe. Well, that represented something. It was like his insignia. That, that robe that he was wearing was a royal robe. It represents authority. It represents power um, and position. And so Jonathan was willing to give that up. He was willing to give what was his completely over to David. And so that's what happens as born-again Christians Christians today. The Bible says that Jesus became a, a curse so that we might be blessed. Galatians chapter chapter 3. Uh, Jesus gives us authority. Jesus gives us power in his, in his name. And so then the Bible says that Jonathan gave his sword. Well, what did that represent? That, well, that meant that if David had to come against uh, uh, foes and enemies if he were to enter into a battle Jonathan would fight for him Jonathan and his family Jonathan would 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 uh, lay down his life in order to save his uh, uh, David's life and so when we handed uh, the sword or if you were to swap weapons that meant that if my tribe had to come into war we'd we, you know you'd protect me and, and I'd protect you so that was a covenant that they entered into and then we see as well that David uh, Jonathan gave his 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 bow and he gave his belt as well which represents also the the armor and so Jonathan gave up his rights for David and just as Jesus gave up his rights for us you know when Jesus went to the cross his robe was stripped from him. He gave up his rights. He gave up his authority. We see that in Matthew chapter 27, verse 28. And when Jesus was on the cross, he could have called down legions of angels. He could have stopped um, proceedings at any moment if he wanted to, but he didn't. He gave it up. He surrendered his life. He became the sacrifice. And in that moment, on that cross, Jesus surrendered if you look at philippians chapter 2 and verse 5 and 5 to 7 it says have this mind among yourselves which is yours in christ jesus who though he was in the form of god did not count equality with god a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men and so that's what jesus did jesus he went from heaven down into this earth and he humbled himself. He became a servant, became a man. Hallelujah. Um, so that we um, could be set free. Let's continue with uh, David and, and Jonathan. If we see in the first book of Samuel, chapter 31 and, and verse 7, we see that Saul and his sons die in battle. And that includes Jonathan. I'll read that um, for you quickly. Now the Philistines were fighting against Israel and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain at Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons and the Philistines struck down Jonathan, Abinadab and Malkishua, the sons of Saul. And there we, we see that um, in verse 6, Saul died and his three sons and his armor bearer. So Saul died, the sons died, the dynasty of Saul was, was no more. And we'll jump now to chapter 2 and verse 9. And this is our main theme, our main text for, for today's uh, lesson. And so if we look there in verse 1, second book of Samuel chapter 9 and verse 1, it says, And David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul? that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. So what happened, this was a, a while after the death, David came into power. He was the king. He had many enemies. He fought many battles. And, 
and when he eventually had all his uh, uh, affairs in order and there was some peace in the land, then he remembered that he has a covenant. He made a covenant with Jonathan. They entered into a covenant. There was a, a, an oath-bounding relationship. And so he says, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. The king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, He is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, at Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, at Lodibar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David, fell on his face, and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? Then the king called Ziba. And so I won't read everything. But what happened was is that uh, David restored Mephibosheth. All the land that once belonged to Saul, David gave that land to Mephibosheth. Where David was crippled, uh, David, uh, uh, Mephibosheth was crippled. He gave Mephibosheth uh, servants um, to take care of him and to look after the land and, and actually to, to work, work for him. And so when we look at Mephibosheth, um, I want to I share, like I said earlier, on three things about God's grace that we can learn from, from the story. And, and first of all, the name Mephibosheth means shame that destroys. Shame that destroys. Can you imagine a name like Mephibosheth? Every time they called him, they would say, Shay, hey, shame that destroys. And, you, you know, he was, he was lame in both feet. How did he, how did he uh, become lame? Well, in the second book of Samuel, chapter 4 and verse 4, the Bible says, Jonathan, the son of Saul, had a son who was crippled at his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And as she fled in her haste, he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. So when they had killed uh, Saul and, and the three sons and the armor bearer, word got to the palace saying that, that they've been killed. And so they, they were fleeing. They were, they were fleeing for their lives because they, in, in those days, they would kill any, if there were any princes left uh, that might um, take revenge for their father's death or, or even continue with, the, with that uh, dynasty. They would want to kill everyone in that family. And so that's why the, the, the Bible says that the, this, uh, this housekeeper... She uh, took uh, the nurse. She took uh, Mephibosheth and uh, they fled. And in, in this haste, he fell and became crippled. And now, you know, in those days, being crippled um, was a major thing because that meant that he, he, he couldn't work. He couldn't earn uh, a living. He couldn't get from A, a to, to Z. And on top of that, the Bible says that this Mephibosheth was living outside of the promised land. He was uh, living uh, on the east side across the Jordan River in a place called Lodibar. And that, that, the word Lodibar means no pasture. Um, and, you know, Mephibosheth was a, was a royal and he was living in shame. He had no future. He was paralyzed in both feet um, and, you know, broken, busted and disgusted. 
no, no purpose, no life, no future, crippled. And many times, uh, I don't know about you, but there were times when I felt um, broken. There were times uh, where I felt alone. And there were times when I felt um, like I had no, no future, you know. Um, and it's not how you start, it's how you finish. Praise God. Come on, somebody. You might have had a, a tough start in life, but I tell you, when Jesus comes to the rescue, He can turn things around for you. Praise God. And so the first thing that I want to share with you about uh, God's grace that we can learn from Fibosheth is, number one, grace seeks us where we are at. Grace will find you wherever you are. <laughs> Look in verse 1 of uh, 2 Samuel 9. And David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? God's grace, grace initiates the relationship. He doesn't wait for us to come to him. In fact, we cannot and do not come to God in and of ourselves. God seeks us and finds us where we are at. God, God, you know, He gets us in our mess. You know, have you ever heard uh, people say when you, when you invite them to church or you give them an, an opportunity to receive Jesus? I've heard this many times before. They, they'll say something like, you know what, Gareth, um, I want to come to church, but you know what, I've got to get my life right first. I, you know, I, I, want to, I want to give my life to Jesus, but, you know, uh, I've, got to, I've got to fix myself up. I've got to get right first. Well, the truth is, you cannot get right out of yourselves. That's why, that's why we need a Savior to save us of, from ourselves. Hallelujah. You know, uh, I don't know about you, but once I was lost, but now, now I'm found. Jesus found me in my mess. Jesus found me in my brokenness. Jesus took me where I was at. You know, I was in the pit and he lifted me up. It's not that I was so holy and I had it all together. And, I, you know, all I had to do was, you know, uh, call on Jesus. And they, that's what I did. But it was Jesus who revealed himself to me. It was his love that was revealed. I had an encounter with him. I, I, he, he came down and, 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 and touched me. Come on, somebody like the song, right? And it's, it's not any, it, it was the grace. It was his love. It was because of his mercy that, that he, he touched my heart, that, that I had an encounter with, with the living God. And so, yeah, David, David says, David is on a mission. Dave, because of the covenant, David is seeking anyone who is still left of the family, of the lineage of, of Saul. And he says, is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? You see, that is the love of God. The love of God, his heart is that none should perish, but that everyone have everlasting life. It is his will that we go out into the nations and preach this gospel and make disciples of all nations. His heart is for the people. His heart is for the lost and he wants people saved he wants people delivered he wants people set free and so in fact we cannot and do not come to god in and of ourselves god seeks us out and finds us where we are at we were where, where were you when when jesus revealed himself you know i told you where i was i was jacked up right i was messed up and then jesus saved me even right now, Jesus knows exactly where you are and, and what you need. <laughs> and there are a few things that we have in common with Mephibosheth. Number one, we were, we were fallen um, in sin. What happened to Mephibosheth? He fell. He fell and he was crippled. Well, when you look at Adam, Adam fell because of the sin. We, we, we were fallen because of sin. We were damaged by the fall of Adam. We are crippled by sin. Mephibosheth once walked with his father. Remember, he was only five years old when he, when he became crippled. 
Um, that means at one stage he was walking with his, with his dad, holding hand in hand, walking with his daddy, and then um, he fell. And so um, Adam at a time walked with God in Eden. Adam, Adam would, would converse with God in Eve, Eden. And because of sin, he fell. I fell. Because of sin in my life, I was crippled. Mephibosheth is crippled. So we can identify with Mephibosheth as being crippled. Hallelujah. And then the other thing is that we were far from God. That's what we have in common with Mephibosheth. Remember, where did they say uh, he was living? He was living out east side on the other side of the Jordan. He wasn't living in the promised land. He was far away from David at that time. And so Adam, because of the sin, was separated from God. Where were you before you gave your life to Jesus? Very far away from God. <laughs> Within your heart, yes, you were far from Him. Our sin alienated us from God. Mephibosheth lived in Lodibar, right? No, it says no pasture. Apart from God, we're, there's nothing in us. Apart from God, we're, we're living in barrenness. Apart from God, we, we, there's no fruit. There's no life. There's no blessing. It's in the place of no pasture, Lodibar. So uh, Mephibosheth was fallen and crippled. We, because of sin, were once fallen and crippled. He's living far away from, from David in Lodibar. Uh, Adam was far away from God. We were once far away from God. Fallen, far. And another thing that we have in, in common with uh, Mephibosheth is we were once fearful of God. Can you imagine what Mephibosheth must have thought when, when uh, David's David's uh, soldiers and es the, the, you know, the whole escort and the entourage was on their way to Mephibosheth. He was probably thinking, oh no, they, they, they found me. They, they, they're going to kill me, right? Because uh, his grandfather wanted to kill David. David was on the run for 12 years from King Saul. And, and because of how things were in those days, as, if things were brutal. Things were, were, were very ruthless. And so... If anyone stood in your way, if there, was an, if there was just a chance that someone would try to usurp you or, or take, take back which was, belonged to your family, they would put you to death, like I mentioned earlier on. And so I could have imagined that Mephibosheth was living in fear. He was fearing David, but little did he know that David wanted to restore him. And you know what? When, when Adam was fallen in sin, what did, the, what did he do? Well, he hid himself from God. The Bible says he, he looked and he saw he was naked. Well, before he, he didn't even see himself naked, but because of that sin, we look inward. We look, we look at our, 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 our the darkness. We look at the sin. We, we, we do not, uh, once Adam was looking outward, he was looking towards his God. He was worshiping his God. He was conversing with his God. He was in relationship with his God. But the moment sin entered, it was, it became inward and and now he hid himself. He, the Bible says that he used fig leaves and he hid himself from God. And when God came, he says, Adam, where are you? And he found him hiding. You know, Mephibosheth, there was fear. And when we are, are not serving God in our sin, there is fear. A fear of God, the wrong fear of God. And so we see here yeah, that Mephibosheth was fallen. He was far from God. And he was fearful of God. But number one, God's grace seeks us where we are at. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, that is point number one. Uh, my time is up today. And I'm, I'm really excited about this message. And I'm going to share with you the next two points next week. So um, thank you for, for joining uh, me today. That is our, our lesson for today. But I want to pray for you before I go. And uh, I want to trust God that uh, He will heal you uh, where you are at. Remember, God, God gets you where you are. You don't have to get yourself together. No, He, he first starts with the heart. He, he's first got to heal you. He, he's, you got to get right 
with Jesus. That, that is the first thing, praise God. And you do that by receiving Jesus. And, and then, you know, where we need healing, where there is sickness and disease, where there is lack, where there is, the, where there is broken relationships, Jesus heals, Jesus sets free, Jesus delivers. And I want to pray for you now because I know that my God is able. Hallelujah. He can do all. He, 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 can, he can do it all. Praise God. Why don't you pray with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for those that are, that are on this um, call today. And I just pray, Father, through the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would find them where they are right now. Whatever they're struggling with, whatever they're dealing with, Lord, that you set them free. You bring the breakthrough. You bring the deliverance. You bring the healer. You are the God who heals. You are the God who provides. You are the God that restores. I pray for provision. I pray for restoration. And I pray for protection in and through your life. Thank you, Jesus, that we can receive you as our Lord and as our Savior. You are our King. You are our Messiah. And we, we praise you. We thank you. We give you all the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, there we go, church. Thank you for being with me today. I enjoyed spending these 30 minutes with you. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Make sure that you get to the, the weekend services. Every weekend we have services in Barsha, for those of you in Dubai, and then at the compound in Abu Dhabi. And uh, wherever you're listening uh, in from, make sure that you get to your local church. Make sure that you are having a church um, face to face. Uh, make sure that you don't, do not forsake the gathering of the saints. Well, church, I'm looking forward to next week. Have a great weekend from me. Bye bye for now.